If you've ever met someone who is genuinely thriving and wondered, what's their secret? Well, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to The Marvelous Podcast with your hosts, Marta Kagan and Steph Ziegler. Welcome to the Be Marvelous Podcast. I'm your host, Marty Kagan, and I am here today without my co-host, Steph Ziegler, who is out on maternity leave. And we are going to spend this episode talking about why you need to train your brain, and not just your brain, also your nervous system, and not just why, but how. We're going to talk about some of the how, because This is a mental health hacks episode, meaning I'm going to share with you some of the best and in some cases, the latest research from the fields of neuroscience and positive psychology around how you can take the reins of your mind, your mood, your nervous system, your well-being, and get into the best mental and emotional shape of your life. Now, before I begin, I want to thank our regular listeners, for being here. We so appreciate your ongoing support. And if you are new, welcome. We're so happy you're here. If you enjoy this episode, we would love it if you would leave a review. Reviews are how new listeners find us and how we're able to share this information with more humans so that more people can thrive and get in the best mental and emotional shape of their lives. So if you would leave us a rating or review on Apple, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, we would be so, so grateful. All right, so let's talk about why you need to train your brain and your nervous system. The truth is that if you aren't proactive about training your brain and your nervous system to work for you, then there's a very, very almost definite chance that the world is training your brain and your nervous system to work against you. Okay, so that is the why. If you're not proactive about training your brain and your nervous system to work for you, the world, life, other people, (laughs) culture, society, all of it, will train your brain and your nervous system to work against you. That's why we're here. That's what we're here to talk about today. And that's why it's so important. Now, I say your brain and your nervous system, really, it's your whole organism because the whole organism, the brain, the nervous system, the skin, the organs, everything, these, all these parts are constantly in conversation with one another. You're not aware of it. You're not aware that your spleen is talking to your kidney, is talking to your shoulder, is talking, you know, like that's just happening in the background. And we're going to get into some of the subconscious stuff that's happening in a minute but they're all talking to each other. And so that's why I don't want to limit it to just, you know, just what's in your head, just your thoughts. Uh, It is a dynamic system. We talk about the mind-body connection, but it's really mind-body nervous system connection. Um, All of it should be operating harmoniously. (laughs) Oftentimes it's not. And oftentimes that is exactly what gets us to start paying attention to our mental and emotional well-being in the first place, right? We hit a wall. We have a breakdown. We lose our shit. We struggle with an addiction. We struggle with depression. We struggle with anxiety or panic attacks or you name it, right? At some point, the system has been sending signals long enough saying distress, 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 and we've been ignoring it long enough and allowing the world, life, the external world to train our brain and nervous systems for us. And eventually the system starts to fall apart. And that's when we go seeking solutions and answers and therapy and medication and treatments and all this stuff. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can make changes daily, small changes, but really important and profound changes, even though from an effort perspective, they are, you know, it requires quite a small amount of effort just done consistently. And those small efforts can have a huge and positive impact on your mental and emotional well-being. That's what we're going to get into today. Let's start with a few really important core concepts. These are sort of like the framework or the context um, that is important to understand before we talk about the things you can do. 
let's let's try and understand the system we're dealing with and then talk about how we can optimize the system. Okay. So here's the system we're dealing with. Number one, your brain and your nervous system, really. Your brain is not here to keep you happy. Okay. Your brain's primary directive and your nervous systems too is to keep you safe, to keep you alive and to keep you safe. And if you look at that directive from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes a lot of sense because when our species began to evolve early in our history, we faced a lot of external threats, right? It was really easy to die and really hard to survive. And so the brain, the primitive brain, evolved to be very good at identifying threats and helping us to quickly escape from those threats, to deal with those threats, I should say, because escape wasn't always the option, right? We learned to flee or fight or freeze or fawn. Um, We developed these very rapid, very effective, and very pronounced responses in order to ensure that the species would survive. This went on for thousands of years. So that primitive part of your brain, which is also often called the reptilian brain, is super efficient, super speedy. It uses very little energy to do its job compared to other parts of your brain. It's really good at what it does. And because it's so good and so fast and so mature, we'll say, the newer part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, the part that makes decisions, or at least the decisions you are aware of, (laughs) the one that understands language and the one that we think of when we think of the human brain, what makes us human is this ability to, to think and connect and you know, create AI and send rockets to the moon, that part of the brain is in its infancy. That part of the brain is an energy hog. It requires a ton of energy. It's way slower than our primitive brain. And meanwhile, it thinks it's all that, right? Like we all think that's what's running the show. I'm here to tell you that is rarely the case. 95% Roughly 95% of all of the activity in your brain, the whole brain, is unconscious. You're not aware of it, in other words. Okay, so the the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that you associate with being you, that is generally not running the show, even when you think it is. And the reason why this is so important, why this is the first thing I wanted to start with today is because if you don't train your brain and your nervous system to be less vigilant, (laughs) to um, take the gas pedal off of the sympathetic response, which is your fight or flight, which is you're like, oh my God, there's a saber tooth tiger around every corner mode. You're going to suffer. You're going to struggle, right? You're going to live in a lot of fear and anxiety and distress. And that is the case for a lot of humans, even though it's 2023 and there are no saber tooth tigers lurking around the corner. Okay. So that's the core operating system. And you really need to be aware of that's what you're dealing with. Okay. Number two, that subconscious thing we were talking about. So 95% roughly of your brain activity is unconscious. And that includes things like making sure your heart beats, making sure you digest food, making sure that, you know, when you're having a conversation with someone, you don't have to think about the next word or how to make your mouth move to form that next sentence, right? You're not always in beginner mode. A lot of things, once you learn them, run on autopilot, right? Like when if you learn how to drive stick shift, in the beginning, you really had to think about each step, right? What gear you put things in and what are you doing with your foot on the clutch and with the gas pedal and on top of it, you know, steering the wheel. You had to think about all these things. It was not autopilot mode yet. It was using your conscious brain, using that 5%. At some point, you developed a neural pathway. You learned how to do those things enough that they became automatic and they went into that unconscious, like it just happens on autopilot mode, okay? A lot of things that you do are on autopilot mode, the vast majority. And where this gets dicey and why training is so important is because there are lots of things that end up in autopilot that are not serving you, okay? Things like beliefs that you have about how the world works, about are people good or bad, is life easy or hard, all of these things, many of which got coded earlier in our lives and were shaped by 
our primary caregivers, our households, our communities, our cultures, the time period in which we were growing up, all of those things helped to create some autopilot programs, we'll say, some pieces of code that now run without your conscious awareness and they can keep you stuck and they can keep you suffering and they can keep you from living marvelously, from feeling your best. They can cause real problems. And so again, that is why we're sharing them as number two, because this becomes pivotal to training your mind and your nervous system. And that brings me to number three, which is that there is this thing called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the brain's and nervous system's ability to rewire itself. So you can create new neural pathways, like brand new ones. For example, when you learn a new skill, let's say you just learned how to play piano, you are creating new neural pathways uh, around how to move your hands, how to synchronize your fingers on the keys, how to read music, et cetera. So you can create new neural pathways. You can prune old pathways. And some of that happens simply by not using them, right? So when you change a habit, when you create a new habit and you stop using the old habit, you get rid of those neural pathways where they basically become decommissioned, right? You don't need them anymore. And this is a dynamic system. So you can influence neuroplasticity, not just through the brain, in other words, not just through thought or mental activity, but through sensory experience, um, through movement, through the physiology of the whole organism, in other words. So you can create neuroplasticity by what you do, by what you think and what you experience. And we're going to talk about all those things. All right. And you can do that no matter how old you are. So those three principles you need to understand in order to understand that this is happening, number one, to all of us. Okay. Number two, there's a really good biological reason for it, right? It's not a bad thing in and of itself. It just is. And that number three, you can change the parts of it that aren't working for you. And it, it's easier than you think, meaning it doesn't require a huge amount of effort. It doesn't require crazy technology or it's not only accessible to people that have a lot of resources and privilege. Some of these things are super simple. That's why I'm sharing them with you today. You can start doing them today and they can literally change the way your brain works, the way your um, nervous system responds and the way that you function and perform in the world and the way you feel about life and yourself, whole experience. All right. To illustrate this whole point more clearly, especially the part about the subconscious mind, um, because it's going to lead into mental fitness hack number one, I want to share something that will, I think, illustrate this point. And it comes from a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, who talked about two ways to get at the truth of something two ways to get at the truth of something. One way he calls the way of the scientist. And the other way is the way of the lawyer. This is a really useful analogy for how our minds work. So the scientist, the way of the scientist involves gathering evidence, uh, looking for patterns and forming theories to explain our observations. And then you test those theories, right? A lawyer, on the other hand, begins with a conclusion, okay? Whereas the scientist draws the conclusion based on their activities, the lawyer begins with a conclusion and they then seek evidence that will support that conclusion and also will attempt to discredit any evidence that does not support that conclusion, right? So the scientist is saying, let me take a look at what is here and and see what I can, how I can make sense of it. Let me find some patterns and things that I recognize. And then based on that information, I'm going to form a theory and then I'm going to test that theory. And the lawyer says, I have the answer. I already know the answer. Now I'm going to gather evidence that supports what I believe is the answer and discredits anything that refutes it. Okay. Our brains are a mix of the two. And most of us think that our brains are more the scientist. Most of us believe we make logical decisions. We do our research. We think it through, right? Like that, <laughs> that is how we do things. But what the research shows is that most human thought processes start with a belief and then go for evidence, not vice versa. So in other words, your brain is an outstanding lawyer and a decent scientist. Or another way of saying it is that your unconscious mind is a master at taking limited data and constructing a version of a world that appears realistic 
that is totally believable, like you don't even realize that you're doing this, and then presents that to the conscious mind. And the conscious mind says, oh, this is what it is. This is true. Mm-hmm. And that's where things can go wrong, right? Because if the belief is, or the worldview is that you are not worthy, or you are not good enough, or you're an imposter, you will never be able to accomplish this thing, you're not lovable, you're not capable, right? When that's the belief, and now your outstanding lawyer is just looking for evidence to support that, and their conscious mind isn't even aware that this is happening, do you see now how your brain and your nervous system can work against you? They work against you. They keep you in fight or flight mode. They keep you feeding, you know, feeding this monster, so to speak. But you can change that. Again, that is why we're here. All right. So let us dive into mental fitness hack number one. Warning, you're not going to like it. <laughs> Even though it is absolutely the easiest, lowest hanging fruit out there, like the and it will dramatically improve things for you. You're not going to believe me and you're not going to like it when I tell you. But I'm going to tell you anyway. Mental fitness hack number one is do not look at your phone first thing in the morning. In fact, don't look at it for at least the first hour if possible. And here's why. When you check your phone immediately after waking up, it forces your brain to skip two very important stages in the waking cycle. And I'm going to get into the detail on that in a second. but it skips those two stages and therefore primes your brain for distraction and distress. So it's sort of like the modern day equivalent of being woken up by a saber-toothed tiger every morning. It's slight, slight exaggeration, but not really in terms of its impact on your nervous system. Okay, so let's take a closer look. Here's what happens in the sleep-wake cycle. When you're asleep, when you're in deep sleep, This is known as the delta state. This is the most restful state for your brain and your nervous system to be in. Um, Everything's slowed down. You know, your respiratory rate slows down. Everything is resting. Okay, that's when you're in the delta stage. And when you come out of deep, deep sleep, normally you go into the theta stage, which is sort of like that daydreamy state where, you you know, you're not uh, fully unconscious, but you're you're not conscious yet. You might recognize this as when you're like drifting into or out of sleep. Uh, So it's that sort of daydreaming. That's theta. And then from there, you go into alpha. The alpha state is when you are now awake, you're conscious, but you're not processing a ton of information yet. You're just like starting to come online, right? Like you press the power button, the machine is, is powering up, the computer is powering up and doing its like startup cycle. And then after that happens for a bit, then you go into beta. That is your fully alert and awake state of consciousness. That's how I am right now, hopefully. (laughs) Uh, How you are as you're listening to this, that is our normal, fully awake, fully functioning and online brain state. When you pick up your phone first thing in the morning, what happens is you skip the theta and the alpha stages. So you go directly from the delta, from deep sleep, to beta, wide awake, like that. That's why I'm bringing up the saber-toothed tiger as the (laughs) equivalent to the phone. That is jarring. That is priming you for a stress response, especially if when you pick up the phone, the first thing you see is something negative or stressful. You know, maybe it's a angry email from a customer from your boss, or it's a headline about earthquake that happened overnight, or a shooting, or your ex posts a picture of their engagement on Instagram, whatever it is, right? It, that is a terrible thing to do to your nervous system. And so in effect, what you are doing is you are training your mind or your nervous system by choosing to pick up your phone first thing in the morning and you're training it to be hypervigilant to start off the day in fight or flight mode. And I cannot tell you how many people do this. Uh, honestly, like it's 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 an epidemic or a pandemic. It's some kind of epidemic because <laughs> most people do this. We use our phones as our alarm clocks. So even if we tell ourselves we're not going to scroll through Instagram or we're not going to open our email or we're not going to, you know, 
look at the news first thing in the morning, the sheer fact that that bone is in your hand, um, there's, there's just too good of a chance that it will. And even if you don't scroll on anything, even if you use it for an alarm clock, well, let me share a study with you that will make you not want to do that either. <laughs> because it turns out that the mere presence of a smartphone in the room with you can decrease your cognitive capacity. Okay. Now this, I'm quoting a study that came out of UT Austin in 2017, where they had 800 smartphone users um, and they were put in different groups. One group had their phone on the desk, like nearby, but, you know, turned off, not in use, but just present. Some had the phone in their pocket or in a bag, but in the room with them and others had the phone in a completely different room. So it was not even in the room with them. And then all of the study participants were asked to complete some tasks on a computer. And then they looked at who performed better. And so in this, the first part of the study where they did this, what they found was a very clear linear relationship to where the phone was. Meaning the further the phone was away from you, the better you performed. So the people with the phone in the other room did the best. People with the phone in the pocket, in their pocket or in their bag. So in the room, but not visible they were next in line and the people that had the phone visible performed the worst. And to be clear, when I say the phone was visible or near them, the phone was not turned on. It was off. It was not sending them notifications. It was not tempting them to scroll through while they were doing their tasks. No, it was merely it visible to them. They knew it was there. And that alone caused a cognitive drain. They did another test with this group where they explored people's perceived dependence on their smartphone. So they were asked, you know, how much do you feel that you need your smartphone to function on, on a daily basis? Like how much do you use it? How much do you rely on it? Um, which I know for me, you know, I run a business, I do a podcast. <laughs> I spend a lot of time sharing content on social media to help people become more mentally and emotionally fit. And so I have the phone a lot. In addition to, you know, the other reasons I might use a phone like to order DoorDash or play the New York Times crossword puzzle. So they asked, how dependent do you feel you are on it? And what they found is the ones who were the most dependent on their phone, they performed worse than their less dependent peers, which you would expect. However, they only performed worse when they kept their phones on their desk or in their pocket or bag. So if the phone was in the other room, they performed just as well as the people who did not feel they were dependent on their smartphones. Okay, it was only the presence of the phone. Again, clear and strong evidence that the smartphone is a drain on your brain. It is training your brain and your nervous system to leak capacity. Okay, so if I can leave you with just one tip, just one hack, one thought, one piece of advice, one thing I hope you'll do after listening to this episode to improve your mental and emotional well-being to begin training your brain and your nervous system to work for you is do not have your phone in your room when you sleep. Do not have your phone in your room when you're doing something important. Do not pick up your phone first thing in the morning. Give yourself at least 30 minutes, preferably at least an hour to wake up organically before you pick up the smartphone and allow it to have an impact on your mental and emotional state. Okay. Mental fitness hack number two, rest. Well, that's right, folks. Rest, mental and emotional rest. Now, when I say rest, I want to be clear, it, that can take several different forms. So rest for your brain and your nervous system can come in the form of sleep. So a good night's sleep. It can come in the form of a nap. It can come in the form of meditation or meditative-like activity. Or it can come in the form of breath work. And the fifth one I'll throw in there is through non-sleep deep rest or NSDR, which is a term coined by a neuroscientist named Andrew Huberman. Um, but any of those are best, most recommended ways to give your brain and your nervous system some rest. Now, I want to get a little more specific about each of those. We'll start with sleep. Um, we can and will have a whole separate mental fitness hacks episode on sleep. 
where we'll share a lot more of the research and the guidance around this and like, what does science say? And anecdotally, what can we recommend? But I'll start with this. Make a conscious effort to increase the quality and the quantity of your sleep. Okay. And you can do that with things like, number one, trying to stick to a relatively consistent sleep and wake time. So roughly half an hour flush time there. Um, you know, if you normally go to bed at 11 and you go to bed at 1130 or you go to bed at 1030, not a big deal. But if you need to go to bed at 11 to get seven or eight hours of sleep and you're staying up till one, one night and the next night you go to bed at 11 and the next night you go to bed at two and the next night you go to bed at 10, that inconsistency is a disaster for your sleep hygiene, for your circadian rhythms and for your ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. So try and be consistent about what time you go to bed and what time you get up. And if possible, aim for seven to eight hours of sleep. Everyone's body's different, but that's the recommended dosage of sleep. <laughs> um, sleep in a dark room. So blackout curtains, shades, an eye mask, all of those things will help improve sleep. Sleep in a cold room or at least a cool room. You want your body temperature to drop about one degree in order to um, support the best deep sleep. Limit screen time within a, a few hours of your normal sleep times. And if you are going to use screens or you have to for work, you know, dim them, turn the lights down. In fact, dim the lights in whatever part of your home you're spending time in or wherever you are, turn the lighting down. That signals to your brain and your nervous system, it's getting late. We're going to be resting soon. Okay. So those are some really quick, super low hanging fruit tips around sleep hygiene. In addition to getting a good, good night's sleep, Let's talk about naps. I personally am a terrible napper. I don't do well with a nap. I need more time, I think, to shift through those brain states we talked about before, you know, to go from beta where I'm awake and alert and to like power down all the way to the theta stage and then bring it back up. I can't do that in 10 to 20 minutes. I know some people can. I cannot. The only time I can nap well is when I'm sick. And that usually requires longer periods of napping for me for the previously mentioned reason. But if you are a good napper and you can do a power nap um, and you cycle through those phases faster and you feel rested afterwards, more power to you. Please nap. Nap early and often. <laughs> nap daily. Um, it seems like it's a luxury to take a nap and you may not be in a position to, but if you are, do it. That little bit of extra rest that's like a recharge. It's like plugging your, your battery in, right? When your phone battery gets low, you plug it in, right? Before that phone dies. So do that if you can. If you're not a napper, I recommend either meditation or breath work or non-sleep deep rest. To me, those three are somewhat interchangeable and in that they all serve the same purpose. They are a way for you to allow your brain and your nervous system to power down and rest without going completely into deep sleep mode. Okay. And they can have the same beneficial effects that deep sleep can have in a shorter amount of time. Um, so meditation, most of you are familiar with. Meditation is really well, you probably picture it in your mind as sitting with your eyes closed and emptying your mind and thinking about nothing. Um, and if that's how you picture it, then that's probably why you're not meditating. Cause that sounds awful and boring. <laughs> uh, really what meditation is, is taking a few minutes during your day to be present. And the way I think of it is, you know, normally during the day, your conscious mind is like a raging river. It's just a raging river. And there's, you know, thoughts just ra racing down that river all day long, 60,000 roughly of them per day. And you are in the river with it and you are part of the river. And meditation is stepping out of the river and standing on the river bank and watching, just observing without reacting to or panicking about or wanting to change or like being sucked into the river. So it's just taking a few minutes to notice what's going on. So you may be thinking, you may have thoughts, but you are not attaching to those thoughts. You are paying attention to your breath. You are paying attention to sensations in your body. You're paying attention to the sounds in the room, or you are just paying attention to what your brain is doing. Like it's acting like a bored puppy looking for something to chew on without becoming the bored puppy. You are with your thoughts and not in your thoughts. Um, so it does not necessarily mean 
your brain is empty and you're doing nothing for 20 minutes. But what it does mean is that you are intentionally creating an environment of rest for your brain and your nervous system. And it's an acquired taste in my experience. It takes practice, but it is beautiful. It is worth it. And 15 minutes of meditation, even if it's what I would call shitty meditation, or at least it seems shitty in the beginning, meaning that your mind is racing and you're constantly like noticing that, oops, I fell in the river again, got to climb up on the riverbank. Two seconds later, fuck, I'm in the river again, got to climb up on the riverbank. And you're kind of doing that in your head, which happens to me still, even after years of meditation practice, still happens sometimes. That's okay. You're still creating a break. You're still providing rest. Um, every time you bring yourself back to the riverbank is a victory. Every time you bring yourself back, you are improving your level of mental and emotional fitness. Okay, so that's meditation. Breath work, very similar, um, except you don't have to have your eyes closed. And the tool here is less your thoughts or your mind and more your body because you're focusing on your breath and you're breathing intentionally, right? We all breathe all the time without thinking about it. You don't have to think about it. But when you do make your breath conscious and you choose how long your inhale is and how long your exhale is and whether or not you hold your breath and where you feel the breath, that intentional conscious choice to breathe in a certain way and to do that for, again, five to 20 minutes can completely change the makeup of your nervous system and how your brain works. Like that is amazing training. And again, the research supports this. This is not just my opinion. There is a growing wealth of data that suggests that when you change your breathing pattern, you change how you feel, you change how you function, you change how your cells communicate with one another. You you change your whole makeup, like you change the cellular or neural structure of your organism. That is amazing. And you're just doing that with your breath. Fucking cool is that. Also, <laughs> breathing consciously and intentionally, especially if you're doing a relaxing breath, like um, the physiological sigh or cyclic sighing or box breathing or the 2x breath, those things all shift you into your parasympathetic nervous system. They signal to your brain, your nervous system that you are safe, that it is okay. You know, you don't have to be vigilant. You can relax. That provides rest. And then the final one is an SDR or non-sleep deep rest. And basically guides you through breathing a certain way and then consciously engaging and relaxing different parts of your body. So it's a like a body scan, body awareness. Uh, exercise. You do this with your eyes closed. You can do this lying down. So it's the closest thing to napping <laughs> without falling asleep. Uh, it's very similar to yoga nidra, if you're familiar with that practice, but it's another tool to try. And it might just be the one that for you is like this. This is my jam. This is going to be how I introduce more rest into my day. Mental fitness hack number three, choose your focus or choose your attention is another way to say this one. And what I mean by that is be intentional about what you give your attention to during the course of a day. Because whatever you're giving your attention to is in effect training your brain and your nervous system. If you are giving a lot of attention to, for example, negative thoughts, to criticisms, that is going to, remember, your whole organism is communicating with all the cells are communicating with each other. So as you're having that thought, the cells in your body are going, oh shit, prepare, right? We need, to, we need to stress out right now. We need to get ready for a battle. If you are paying attention to things that you enjoy, if you were paying attention to sensory pleasure, for example, the delicious aroma of the coffee in your morning coffee cup or the velvety texture of the upholstery in the chair that you're sitting in. If you give more attention to the things that soothe your nervous system, that bring you into the kind of state that you want to be in, the better. You get to choose. And it's a crazy thing. I, I, when I first realized that I have a choice in what I think about, I was like, wait, what? Hello. <laughs> 
I can stop thinking about this thing that's torturing me. Um, it's like my grandfather used to say, if you tell someone they're a pig often enough, you keep calling them pig, 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 eventually they will start to oink. And he meant what I'm saying to you now, that if you repeat something enough times, if you focus on it, if you just give it your attention, even if you're not saying it out loud, you're thinking it, that is creating a whole neurochemical cascade of events inside your system that is training it. And this is not, this is not a woo-woo tip, even if it sounds like it. I, I'm not saying that, you know, if you tell yourself that you can fly, that you're going to grow wings. Okay. I'm not, not saying that, but there's a huge realm of, there's a lot of content that goes through our minds every day that is not fantasy, that is not impossible to our knowledge, right? It is not unrealistic, quote unquote, but nevertheless is really detrimental to our mental and emotional well-being. You know, how many times a day do you tell yourself that you're too fat or you're 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 not making enough money or you're not lovable enough, you're not worthy enough, nobody takes you seriously. You know, <laughs> there's any number of thoughts that may go through your mind that again change your neurochemistry, change your biochemistry. Choose your focus, people. That is my message here. Remember my original thesis at the beginning of this episode was if you're not proactive about training your brain and your nervous system, the world will train it for you. That's already happening. Okay. The world is constantly training us. We are getting messages through the media we consume, the people we spend time with all the time. Um, what we choose to pay attention to, that's up to us. I will say that when you first practice this, it will feel awkward and you may give up quickly. You may go, this is never going to work for me. You know, like I spent five minutes doing what Marta said. I tried paying attention to the delightful aroma of my coffee, but I still ended up coming back to thinking about how much I hate my job and how miserable I am. Okay, cool. You got to do it probably for more than five minutes. This is about repetition and consistency. And I'm willing to bet a whole lot of money that you're not even aware of how often you're giving your attention away to things that are sabotaging you, to things that are training your brain and your nervous system to work against you. So it's going to take some repetition, some practice, some consistency to flip that on its head. It's going, to, it's going to take a while. And that doesn't mean it's hard. It's not hard. It's just not a habit yet. And it's not something that you're used to doing. And it, you're, when you're not paying attention to what's happening in your head or where you are giving your attention, it goes wherever it's gone before, right? It just like follows the familiar pattern. That's the well-worn path. So you have to be intentional about it. In fact, being intentional is like the subtext to every single one of the mental fitness hacks I'm sharing. Mental fitness hack number four, change your environment. What do I mean by change your environment? So first of all, when I say environment, I'm referring to two categories. One is your physical environment, right? So what, what is in the room with you or what room are you in? Or maybe you're not in a room, you're outside, but what is around you physically? And then number two is the people that are part of your environment, the people that you spend a lot of time with, the people who have an influence or impact on your brain and your nervous system, whether you realize it or not. So let's talk about environment first. Um, the simplest way to illustrate what I mean by this is, let's say you want to sleep better, right? Let's say you... Um, you, you really took tip number two to heart and you're like, yes, Marta, I'm going to focus on getting more rest and I'm going to improve my sleep hygiene. Cool. What is your bedroom like? Does your bedroom support sleep? Do you find yourself doing things other than sleeping in your room quite often? Things that are actually the opposite of sleep, right? Like, do you work in bed, for example? So you've trained your brain and your nervous system to recognize the bed as a place of work, not necessarily of rest. That's a simple thing you can change in your environment. You can just behaviorally treat that space as sacred for a different purpose. What's the lighting like in your bedroom? Is it too bright? Do you have overhead fluorescence? Can you install a dimmer? Can you introduce some candles or some um, lower wattage bulbs into your table or floor lamps? 
can you take the TV out of there? Because that ain't going to help you sleep, right? Those screens are not helpful in powering down. Can you leave your phone in the other room and have an old fashioned alarm clock? All these things are things about your environment that you can do. And that's just an example with sleep. You can apply those same things to your workspace, right? Is there a lot of clutter? Is there like a stack of unpaid bills that keep mentally draining you, creating that same brain drain that the smartphone did in that study I cited earlier? Put those someplace else when you're working. And train yourself that when you sit down at your desk or wherever it is that you do your work, that's all you do there. Okay. You don't scroll through Instagram there. You don't watch YouTube videos about stuff that's not related to the task you're trying to complete. Train yourself that when you put your butt in that chair, what you do is work. So this is what I mean about environment. It's not just about what's in the space or what space you're in, but also how that space is used on a regular basis. And then the other category, people. The people that you spend the most time with can have a very profound impact on you. And again, there's data to back this up. Uh, they've studied brains of people that spend a lot of time together, people that live together. And you, what they found is that their brain structure actually starts to mirror one another. We have these mirror neurons where we mirror body language and we start to, our brain waves start to sync up and our heartbeats start to sync up. Like it's this crazy phenomenon where we really, we sync up basically. So you are influenced even if you don't realize it. Even if you think that you're the influencer in your group, you are being influenced as well. And so I encourage you to give some thought to who are the two to five people that you spend the most time with on a regular basis to think about who they are and then ask yourself the following three questions. Number one, how do you feel when you're with them? Number two, how do you feel when you leave them? And number three, how do you feel about them? Now, they might sound like they're all the same question, but they're different angles at trying to understand what is the mental, emotional, physical, spiritual impact that they have on you that you might just, you're, you know, you're just so used to it that you don't even realize. So really do that. Really ask yourself those questions with each one of them. I recommend spending a little bit of time with pen and paper, writing this down like a journaling exercise and really exploring how do they make you feel, right? How do you feel when you're with them? How do you feel once you leave them? How do you feel right after you've spent some time with them? And how do you feel about them? What, what words would you use to describe that? And you know, think of how you feel physically, think of how you feel emotionally, think of the mood you're in, think of the things you talk about, think of the things that you do together and just, you know, assess because you may find that some of the people in that inner circle are training your brain and your nervous system to work against you. And so that needs to change. Okay. That brings us to mental fitness hack number five. And I want to be clear, I have presented these in order of skill level. <laughs> so number one was the beginner's mode, right? Like that's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit. As we've gone through from one, two, three, four, and five, each of these has leveled up a little bit in its challenge level, I suppose, meaning that it may be a little bit harder and require a little more practice or concerted effort or uh, focus. So number five, I left for last because it's definitely the most advanced level one. It doesn't mean it's less important. It just means you might want to work your way up. Um, and that is to feel your feelings, to feel your feelings. If you listen to the show a lot, you've heard me say this a lot. What I mean by feel your feelings, I mean, take some time to, in a, in a safe environment, to truly, fully embody and process your emotions, okay? Most of the time, we suppress feelings, we avoid feelings, we numb feelings. This is normal. This is, this is normal. Normal human behavior. This is why we talk about blowing off some steam. This is why we pour ourselves a glass of wine or a beer or a scotch or whatever at the end of the day. We have all kinds of coping tools, all kinds of things we do externally 
to process energy that has been built up over the course of the day and the many challenges and ups and downs of a a day in the life of a human. And very few of them involve actually feeling the feelings. And we don't spend a lot of time actually feeling our feelings, especially the ones that are uncomfortable, that are painful. And again, that is normal. But when you bury your feelings, you bury them alive. And so they are still acting upon your organism, upon your system. You are training your brain and your nervous system to suppress that stuff and to put it someplace else. And remember, your brain and your nervous system exist to keep you safe. And so even though you're like, no, no, they're like, yes, yes, these things are here and they're real and they're scary. We got to deal with them. So we're going to we're going to make them, you know, find their way to your hip or to your head in the form of a migraine or, you know, they they find their way to be expressed. What I'm saying is if you feel your feelings, if you embody your feelings, you can get them out. You can metabolize them. And then they don't torture you. (laughs) And then your nervous system works for you, not against you. And then you can be a healthy, happy, well-adjusted, self-regulating human who can show up and be their most marvelous self every day. And so this is what I mean about feeling your feelings, about processing them. I mean, in a safe environment, you're going to invite whatever feeling it is that has been suppressed into the room, up on stage. Like you can actually picture them on stage. Like, this is now your time to perform, rage monster. (laughs) And you invite them on and the spotlight is shining on them. And then you, you feel what they're feeling. You allow them to express themselves. And so if that looks and sounds like screaming or pounding your fists on the floor or flailing about like a toddler having a temper tantrum, If it means sobbing, crying, let the tears come, it means feeling it. And you see this in the animal world. The animals do this. They get chased by a predator. They're super stressed. They're in super fight or flight mode. And as soon as they're in safety, they shake it off. They shake it off. They physically like process that energy that just got built up so they can go on with their day. So allow yourself to process that emotion. Allow at that moment on stage to say what it needs to say, to feel what it needs to feel, to cry it out or rage it out or dance it out or whatever. And then give it a little round of applause and it comes off the stage. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that the transformation that happens there under safe circumstances can be instant healing. Literally, it can instantly transmute that and pre- put an end to a trauma loop. The trauma loop can literally collapse through feeling your feelings <laughs> in a safe environment. It can crumble to the ground, right? Once a full experience of an emotion is embodied, it can literally instantly and permanently erase the residue of that traumatic experience or moment. Because when we have traumatic experiences. It is the world training your brain and your nervous system, basically. And so in this case, you are taking the reins and you are saying, okay, I I need to process this. I can't keep holding on to this. I'm going to feel it. And then we are now rewriting the code through the simple act of allowing that to be expressed. Now, if you've never experienced this, you're listening to me explain this, and you've never experienced what I'm talking about, your logical brain is going to go, that won't work. That's that's ridiculous. She's talking about something that's not possible or it's not possible for me. You're going to dismiss it. And that's normal. Um, but you're wrong. And I say that again, not as opinion, but the data is out there. The data supports this. You need to process this stuff. So that's why I left this for number five, because now we're getting to the whole topic of trauma loops and, you know, things that you might be holding on to for a really long time. The more beginner level version of this tip is to feel your feelings often and to not go through the whole suppression thing, um, to process them as often and as completely as possible. But also you may need to go a little deeper and a little harder with the work. And so working with a therapist that you trust or someone that can hold the space for you to feel your feelings And then from there, feel your feelings on a regular basis, people. Train your nervous system and your brain to do that, and it will work wonders for you. Okay, so just to recap quickly, 
mental fitness hack number one, don't look at your phone first thing in the morning. Don't have your phone in the room if possible. Mental fitness hack number two, rest. Whether that's a nap, a good night's sleep, some non-sleep deep rest, some meditation, some breath work, give your body, your nervous system, and your mind a chance to rest and self-regulate. Number three, choose your focus. Pay attention to what you pay attention to and consistently, regularly turn your attention to the things which support your well-being. Number four, change your environment. Make sure that your environment supports you, whether it's your physical environment or the people to whom you give your mental and emotional energy, your time, your attention. And then number five, feel your feelings. And lastly, I'll say before we wrap that all the things that I shared today, these are the kinds of exercises that we bake into our inner workouts at the Marvelous Mental Emotional Fitness Gym. These are the kinds of things that we cover and go deep on and, so, and support you in actually practicing and keeping you accountable and consistent, actually doing the stuff in the marvelous mental emotional fitness boot camp. These are the kinds of things that our community is always talking about. We are cheering each other on. You can find accountability partners. You can work with one of our coaches. You don't have to do this alone is really my message here. That's why we built Marvelous because we wanted to make it easy for you, accessible for you to learn these tools, to use them, to access them anytime, to enjoy practicing them, and to do so consistently because consistency is key. Also, to give you the support because it is much, much, much easier to change and grow and improve and train when you're in community, when you're doing that in community, when you have peers and partners and coaches we're doing it with you and cheering you on and celebrating your victories and picking you up when you fall down. That's what Marvelous is about. So if you're interested in that level of support in working on this stuff with others who are also dedicated to training their brains and optimizing their nervous systems to getting in the best mental, emotional shape of their lives, I urge you, I encourage you, I welcome you to check out Marvelous. Go to bemarvelous.com, B E M A R V E L U S.com. Hit the big free trial button anywhere on the site. Sign up for a free seven day trial. Check it out for yourself. As always, I am so grateful that you shared your time and attention with me today. I hope you found this information valuable and that these mental emotional fitness hacks actually improve your mood, your mindset coping skills your life. I'm so happy you joined me. We will be back next week. Until then, be marvelous. 